What the Tech is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. And by Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash GFQ. Hey everybody, welcome to another amazing What the Tech. I am Andrew Zarian, and of course I'm joined by uh, the world traveler, Paul Tharad. How you doing, Paul? I am pretty well. How you, are you? You traveled the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, were, we were talking, uh, we were speaking prior to starting the show, and uh, you're traveling again. You're going to New Zealand. Yes, I am. Which is beautiful over there. Is it? I've, I've never been. They should make a movie or something to show it off. It's almost like every movie. Every movie that has a, like that scene <laughs> is always New Zealand. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, yep. This is What the Tech. Uh, we discuss things happening in technology, obviously. Uh, I, I think what we should do is have a What the Tech brand, like What the Brand. So it'll be What the Car. <laughs> right. What the Kitchen. It'll be a nice show. Paul and I will cook together. You know what I don't approve of, though? That New Zealand and Australia, I guess, have different power plugs than the rest of the planet you know yeah there's like there's like two european plugs there's a U, there's two u.s type plugs actually three i guess depending on how you look at it four even there are many u.s plugs whatever and i don't understand why we can't get together on this stuff you know just have one unified plug well they've tried that multiple times i was reading an article a couple of years ago about how they tried to have like a universal plug yeah and they, they just it, it would just require such an overhaul of infrastructure but, and almost every single new build it would be nearly impossible i actually don't think it would be that difficult USB. as long as it was the rest of the world that changed and not us well usb what if we go to like a usb type plug? just go to usb everything usb right. everything right. usb toasters usb microwaves i think that's the future i don't mind buying the converters i just mind having like six set of sets of converters you know how, yeah, because you were in Europe, and that's totally different. So yeah, continental Europe has basically two types: um, England and I guess Great Britain. Air, you know, has the, the bigger ones. The big Asia shot. has different one. Uh, you and uh, Australia and New Zealand have different plugs. It's kind of it, silly, right? The I voltage mean, doesn't matter. Some I, I can actually see the the chat thing, which is a mistake, but. Um, the voltage doesn't matter because the power supply is on almost any device can handle the change. And so, um, like even this thing right here, so look how small, like uh, if you're familiar with like a small Apple one, this is a Nokia one, this can handle 240, 110, whatever. I mean, and that's an American, that's a US. Yeah, this yeah. is a US plug. It's a teeny one. Um, it's not that it's just, it's literally the, you know, the physical connection. The little the blades and the pins and things, you know. It's it's surprising that there's no like universal standard. You know, they can't agree. Like, who's making the money off of this? That it can't know, be done. It's like, right, it's like the powerful power converter <laughs> lobby. You like, know, I, I imagine like in order for something like this not to become standardized, there has to be money in it, holding I, it back. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's like crazy. three families that own all the plugs and they're at war with each other. It's like yep. the Hatfields and McCoys, you know. <laughs> You can buy, agree. if you're into this kind of thing, my, my dad works for a lighting company, and so I was actually just discussing this with him, but you can actually buy universal power receptacles for your home here in the U.S. Uh, Levitron makes them, is the name of the country, a company, and uh, it, these power plugs will accept U.S. plugs and con uh, continental Europe or Great Britain-style plugs as well. Like, you can get a single receptacle... That will take either type. So what do you do? You just change the little... No, it's it stays the same. So in other words, huh. um, in, in the European plugs are like kind of like um, uh, conical, you know, circular holes or, or pins or whatever. And we yeah. have these flat blades. Um, it's it's both the blade and the circle together in, in one hole oh, that's on each side. And so it will take any kind of plug. Well, not any kind. I mean, it will take, you know, any of the two ty types of plugs. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, but we, but we have the circle too. 
And we have the flag. Well, we have the three prong and the two prong. Yeah. And we also have something like universal versus non universal. Oh. So you know that we have the, the three prong, three, I'm sorry, I guess it would be two prong plugs where, two blade plugs where one of them is slightly bigger than the other. Yeah. So you can't put it in one way, but you can only put it in the other. Well, we have the issue here because the house is so old where if we put it in, it just falls out. Actually, so <laughs> we had the electrician in just this morning because we have rewired virtually my entire house. And when anyone from like uh, Verizon or one of those companies comes in, they look at my panel. They can't believe it. They say, we don't see stuff like this unless it's in a, you know, a huge building or an apartment building or something. But it's really nice. It's like industrial quality, everything like yeah, hospital but, grade. But the one thing they didn't do over when you think about this from the original wiring was the doorbell. And so the doorbell has been making this sickly sound lately. Like you ring it, it's like, <laughs> ring, and it sounds terrible. So my son comes upstairs and he goes, hey, my, uh, my screen just shut off. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I don't know, someone rang the doorbell and the screen shut off. And so we were testing it. And sure enough, when you ring the doorbell, the screen shuts off. It's <laughs> hysterical. And so the guy came and he looked at it and he goes, uh, yeah. So he had no idea what caused this. He goes, my best guess is it's probably ghosts. And you should probably just get a wireless doorbell and disconnect. It was, it's like the one part of the house that hasn't been completely redone. And he's like, I'd have to go through the entire house with this really teeny thin wire that they have to use for this. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, our house was built in 19, the electrical was put in 1913. Yeah, oh, jeez. So we have those heavy gauge cloth. Like cloth, yeah, that, which is like a huge fire hazard. A huge fire, and you don't know what's, what's you know, uh, red well, no, and what's it's, black. It, well, plus it's in the wall yeah. with paper. You yeah, know, yeah like sure. In the wall, you know, and like one spark, and you know, it's like a, a giant tinder. I actually thought I was I was burning the entire house down uh, a couple of years ago. I was doing some electrical work, and I'm pretty good with this stuff. But I, I guess I got a little confused, and I didn't test what's what's hot and what's not. And I wired uh, a new light fixture to the wall. Yep. And when I turned when I when I connected and I turned it on, it just smoke came out of everywhere, and smoke was coming from the outlets. From two of the outlets at the other end of the house, smoke was coming out of it. And uh, I freaked out, and I just stood there staring at the wall, hoping there's no fire. And uh, luckily for me, there was no fire. But uh, everything just, would have burnt down, and I would have had to explain to everybody that I was trying to rewire something, and uh, I set the house on fire. <laughs> it would not have been good. No. Uh, but this is, uh, this is uh, electrical talk here on the GF Kino. Actually, be before we leave the electrical topic, I will, I will give you one more uh, story about this. Because uh, years ago when we did a home swap, we brought an Xbox with us. Because we figured we're taking the kids away for three or four weeks. Mark can play the Xbox. And the Xbox, as you probably know, has a gigantic power supply. And so it never even occurred to me. Like I showed you this te these teeny plugs that can go from different voltages. I thought, well, clearly... This giant Xbox power supply can handle this. And so we plugged it in in, um, in France with an adapter, and we took the power out in the entire building. Are you kidding me? No, and melted the power supply. You're kidding me? When, so, when, when was this? Uh, this would have been five years ago. So oh, 2000, my God. Whatever that is, 2007. So here's the thing. And this was obviously the original white Xbox, whatever. But the Xbox power supplies to this day, even the new ones, still don't do voltage switching. And the reason they don't is for, um, uh, what do you call it, like uh, with DVDs, when you go to different countries, they have... Um, oh, the region codes? Region, yeah. region code, right? So there are actually restrictions on games you can sell in certain places. And they have to change games. And what they don't want is someone to take a U.S. Xbox to Europe and then start buying games online. So wait, they, the, the Xbox doesn't have the switch no, for the voltage? No, it's specifically designed not to do voltage switching, even though it's humongous. I had no idea. It's it was... really, yeah, it's crazy. So, uh, you know, oddly enough, I would say at least three or four of the home swaps we've done over the years, the other people have had an Xbox. And you can't bring your games. Like, your games won't work. You can't play a U.S. games, a U.S. game on, a like, a French Xbox. It's their version, what do you call it, uh, region encoded. And um, so we, we have to, you know, we play whatever games they have there. Um, it was very entertaining, by the way, uh, playing uh, Call of Duty World at War in French. You know, it's like a, it's a lot like a French World War II museum where it kind of seems to overplay the French influence. Can uh, you change the language? I no, mean, not in the French version. Really? That's fascinating. Well, eh, we're French. We don't need to change it. <laughs> I I yeah. it, 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 I always find that stuff fascinating. How when you go to another country and like you br you try it, you think it's like the same exact thing. It should it's, work. Bizarre what works, and it's bizarre what doesn't work. Yeah, 
you know, yeah, the carry league. the Xbox all the way to Europe. You know, maybe you shouldn't have. Uh, I, I actually should. I was on Reddit the other day and um, some poster, uh, some guy on Reddit posted that he went to India to visit relatives and he brought his Xbox and it was an issue. And mm-hmm. when he called customer service, they said they'll show up at his house and they did. Customer service showed up at his house and fixed the problem with the Xbox. Hmm. I found that fast. I'm like, ah, that won't happen here. <laughs> I don't think anybody's showing up. I wonder how many calls they get for that, you know? And they just show up at the house. Uh, since we're on the Xbox topic, you can mm-hmm. we? I don't. I don't know if you're what you can and can't say about the new interface that's coming. Yep. Uh, I can't say anything about it. Okay. But I can. I, I can didn't know if you, you were under I mean, an NDA. Speaking generally about what's out in the world, um, you know, it's there's a browser, there's Play Two, which I think some people have been looking forward to. Um, they added YouTube to it, which came out today. I, it was public. I was going to say, I think YouTube's already, yeah, it's out there. Um, there is uh, this, I, I, a lot of people aren't familiar with this, but if you go into the music experience on the Xbox, it lets you pin things, but it's very limited. Like you can, you can pin an artist or an album or a, um, like a song even, I think. It, but, it, but it goes to some weird little area that's only in the music area. So it's kind of ponderous to go find those things. And what, they, what they're adding to the new version through this new dashboard update is the ability to pin whatever. And so if you're familiar with the way the Xbox works today, as you play games and as you run apps and things, they're kind of collected in a, in a most recently used list called, uh, I think it's called Quick Links or Quick something. I don't know. It's right on, the, right on that front page. So they got rid of that. But what you can do now is go in and say, I want to pin this thing to the home screen, you know, whatever it is. Like I, I run Netflix all the time, so I want that front and center. I don't want to have to go into some menu to go find it. I just want it to be there. And so they're they're making that pinning capability, which used to only be part of music and perhaps other parts of Xbox. I'm not positive, uh, but they're making that more of kind of a front and center thing you can do across the board. Similar to how you can pin tiles to the Windows 8. Yeah, yeah. Screen, you know, that kind of thing. You know, my, my biggest question with this is uh, I wonder how – Often people are going to start using the browser on the Xbox. And how will it affect the actual functionality of the device? Does it become a different type of device now that there's a browser on it? Uh, You know, I know they're trying to become this media hub of a device, but uh, I don't don't think the browser gets them there. I mean, I I think it already is a media hub. You know, I think they already have all the apps and everything. You'll be surprised Uh, how often I use the browser on my Google TV. I mean, yeah, and, and I never <laughs> imagined I was sort of searching for stuff, but um, I do. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't do that kind of thing. And I, I think, you know, uh, Sony has one on their PS3. I don't really think a lot of people use it, but I think it's kind of important that they have it. I, 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 it's decent for what it is, but the truth is a lot of the types of things you would want to use a browser for on your big screen you, are already kind of a built-in experiences, you know, like Facebook and Netflix and things like that. There are already apps uh, for that kind of stuff. And frankly, I don't think you could. I, I bet if you went to Netflix on that browser, it would probably try to install a plugin that you can't install because you can't download anything to the local storage in yeah. the Xbox browser or whatever. So I, I don't think that would work. Um, that You know, there's actually, uh, since we're on the Xbox topic, I mean, the one thing, I, this has nothing to do with this dashboard update, but the one thing I'm sort of coming around to is with the Xbox is this notion that They've turned it into an apps machine, right? Like a, it's like a smartphone now. It's like a big, heavy, loud smartphone. You know, it runs apps. And, yeah. and when you think about it, that's what you do. You go in and out of apps. That's, that's really what a game is an app. You know, Netflix is an app. These things are all apps. And, um, you know, the Xbox, because it's a dedicated gaming machine, for all of its multi-core, multi-processor, dedicated GPU and whatever other hardware resources it has, for all of that power, it's kind of a slow thing like yeah, the, yeah it plays games well but the performance of getting in and out of apps is ponderous and slow it's but, really slow but do you think that's because they built on top of this platform rather than building it from the ground up no i think it's because they because when they designed this and remember this was a long long time ago now yeah all of it. so the xbox 360 has been around for many years and so back in the uh you know 2004 whenever they were designing this um it looks so forward leaning right it was such a huge machine power pc you know all these cores and processors, and you know, it was it, it it was probably amazing for the day, but it was designed to be a dedicated gaming machine. That's it, 
And dedicated gaming machines play a game, and that's all they do. But in this multitasking world of the future that we kind of live in now, uh, you know, the next Xbox, one of the big changes is going to be this ability to do multiple things at the same time. You can't, you know, if you go into Call of Duty, because and this is something I, you know, that happens to me all the time, obviously. You know, you you run Modern Warfare Three, and it says, "Hey, by the way, um, there are all these maps you can download now. And you, would you like to download them?" And you say, "Yes, I would like to download them." And then you sit there, and it doesn't download them because downloading is an app, and that has to happen outside of the game. It has so to it, kick it, you out. You, yeah, you have to leave the game, go to the home screen. Go, you can you can watch them download if you want, and you should, so you can find out how long it's going to take. You sit there like a goof while it's downloading. And then you go back into the game to actually see the maps. I mean, it's 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 single tasking. But do you think you know? that's because yeah, because it's an older it's it's an older device. Well, it was, it's a device of its era. It's yeah. just the way it is. But you know, it's funny how old fashioned that is today. Because if the I mean, the lamest smartphone, any tablet, uh, any any computer, of course, you know, iPads, whatever, they can all do. Uh, you, even the iPad can download something in the background while you're doing something else. Yeah. I mean, you don't really think about it, but it's doing that. Um, it's amazing that this thing can't do that, you know, it's, and it's so, it, but it's not just that it's, it, it's not just that it can only do one thing. It's, it's, and you pay attention to this next time you're on the Xbox, very slow moving from thing to thing. You leave Netflix. It says, are you sure you want to need, leave, leave Netflix? Yes. And then, and then it phases it, it kinda, into the it, next it, screen. It, yeah. And the circle thing goes in the middle and there's like, well, you know, and then slowly that screen comes up. I mean, all of the UI stuff for as nice looking as it is. Um, it all happens at a very leisurely pace. You know? It does. It's, it does. It's, it's it, funny how we put up with that. And, and a lot of it, you know, we have to look at the device itself. This is before gesturing was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of that changed with the Wii. But, you know, this is before the Wii. And, and a lot of this idea where everything is kind of streamlined and seamless together, that didn't yep. exist. I think it's you're using this joystick that's programmed for one thing and that's playing games. Yeah. So I'm really curious on how they're going to incorporate the you know the core function of this device and that's a console a gaming console into a all-in-one media device well okay so I, if you're going to use your xbox today as a media device the first thing you get to do is to spend 20 bucks and get that media remote that they have it's very small i have it yeah and light it's great it's great right? yeah. i mean that one of the problems with the xbox remote besides the obvious is that it turns off if you don't touch it and so if you're watching a movie and the phone rings and you want to answer it, you have to spaz out and, you know, wake up the controller and, you know, uh, get it going again. I mean, with the remote control, you could, it just works like a remote control. You, you point it at the screen, you press pause, it works. Um, so that, that, I think, helps, you know, with that kind of thing. But obviously what we need in the future with the next version of the Xbox is something where, you know, you're watching a movie and other things are occurring in the background. You know, uh, maybe they have an experience. And I, I realize they're kind of best, they're, um, early versions of these things now on the Xbox, but... You know, you're watching a movie and other friends of yours are watching the movie at the same time. You can communicate over Facebook or Skype or something and uh, and and do these kinds of interactions. Or, um, you know, you're playing a video game and maybe up in the corner in a picture in picture is uh, a live TV thing, you know, because something's going on in the world. And, and, and that's kind of where I want to go next with this. Um, I, I do believe that these devices have to be incorporated with live television. Oh, yeah. Uh, and and I and I'm so shocked. I told you shocked. they had that in France, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're all using so this Xboxes. exists. We just don't have it here in the U.S. Not really. But right? why? I mean, Google TV has done it. Uh, well, it, I, this is so. This is kind of a non-technical thing. It, it really just dates back to Microsoft's relationships with cable companies. Back over a decade ago, Microsoft was working on a project called Tiger, which was going to be the remaking of cable TV, and. Yeah. and they were at the, remember, they were the most uh, dominant company in the world at the time, and everyone was afraid of them. And the cable industry did not want Microsoft doing to them what they had done to the PC industry. They didn't want to become Microsoft's, you know, slaves. So they resisted everything that Microsoft wanted to do and kind of turned their back on all that stuff and went in a different direction. And every time, we probably talked about this a lot, because every time I yeah. think about my Fios set-top box, which I hate, which is like a piece of equipment from the Apollo moon landing or something. <laughs> it is, yeah. You know, and I look at the awesome, you know, media center slash media room slash ultimate TV, whatever it is, interfaces that Microsoft has created for its own live TV guide, all that stuff. It's so awesome. And it, it would run great on these, well, I don't know these boxes, but it would run great on an inexpensive box and does run great on the Xbox. Um, and so it works. I've seen it, you know, it works great. Um, you can kind of get like a, 
kind of a lame app version of it. If you have uh, Xfinity or uh, Fios, I believe on both of those, at least I know on Fios, you can do a little bit of live TV through that app. It's not exactly the same. But, but here's the thing. I mean, let's let's not even eliminate the cable box, right? Let, let's kind of side with the no, cable no, let's, company. Let's eliminate the cable box. That but, should be the first step. Yeah, I, I personally, I'm with you, Paul. I would want to eliminate the cable box totally. But let let's say why? Let's say they don't they don't go after the cable company and say hey, let's let's incorporate it into the Xbox. But why oh. not do a a almost like a piggyback system where it piggybacks off of the cable box and now you could watch it and everything kind of coincides together. So if I want to go back to TV. I just hit sure. the TV button on this Xbox, and now I'm in TV. If I want to go into uh, the Xbox, I could pull up the screen halfway over the Xbox, over the, the TV. I don't have, like Google TV, pretty much. Right. I, I'm just, I, I'm very surprised that Roku hasn't done this. Why was Google able to do this, and none of the other, I guess, media devices have not? And I wonder if it has something to do with getting deals with the cable companies, or just yeah. figuring no, out a I, way to do it. I literally think it has nothing to do with technology and has everything to do with corporate relationships. I think that is literally That's fascinating it. to me because it's not really taking away from the cable company. Right. But, you know, Google owns YouTube, right? So Google has been on the receiving end of lots of complaints from entertainment content companies over the years. And I think they, you know, the, the upside to all that stuff was they've established these relationships. And I'm so I'm sure... In dealing with these people, they said, hey, by the way, you know, not, uh, okay, so we removed every copy of the, you know, the Barnabas Collins soap opera thing you didn't want on YouTube. And what, But while we're talking, we're going to be coming up with this thing called Google TV. How would you like to, you know, get that on there? Yeah. Or whatever. You know, I, I, that, it helps, you know, when you're a, when you're a platform maker, um, it helps. I mean, you know, the Xbox 360 has a lot of these good content apps, you know, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon's on there now. YouTube is on there. I mean, th there's a lot of stuff to choose from. Uh, unfortunately, like we said earlier, because of the single tasking nature of the UI, it's it's kind of like using an iPhone. It's like, oh, I'm going to watch a movie on Netflix. Oh, it's not on Netflix. Let me go look at Amazon. It's like going in and out of those apps. Is so yeah. ponderous. Well, know? it's the same, the same concept behind, you know, having your Xbox and having to go to input one. You know, and you have your Roku and you got to go to input two. The, the one thing that Google conceptually got right and actually you know the xbox does this too frankly let's say you you could sit down in front of your xbox or your google tv i think I, I don't have as much experience with google tv you have some notion of what it is you want to watch you know i want to watch a particular movie whatever it's called i want to watch superman you know you can search for superman and based on the apps that are installed it will the search results will reflect that stuff so if superman is available on netflix and on hulu and on Amazon Prime or whatever that service is called, um, those will come up in the search results on the Xbox 360, and you can pick the one you want. You know, yeah. and that's a nice way to do it because it's kind of agnostic. It's not they're not just searching Zune, you know, the Zune services that Microsoft has, soon to be the Xbox services that Microsoft has. You know, they're searching across whatever you have installed. It's nice. Yeah, I, I think voice search. Um, I, at first, I thought it was a little gimmicky. And I never expected people to, I, and I know you're talking about um, search on the device, but I think it's voice search will be extremely beneficial on a device like the Xbox. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, using Connect, uh, that's really going to be the way people search. Rather mm -hmm. than typing in Superman 1, they're going to say, uh, su search for Superman 1, right. and it'll pick it up. Oh, no, I think so, too. Yeah. And, and, and if it's smart, you'll, con you'll configure it with the services you prefer in some order. And so if you prefer Netflix the most, you'll just say, play Superman. And it will, it will just go, if it's on Netflix, it will play from there. And if it's not, it will go to the second one down, you know, that kind of thing. It, it, there's no reason this stuff can't be that smart, you know, other than the fact that we're apparently using some kind of 1970s technology. I know, I know, and it's nutty. And, and to, kind yeah. of, to kind of veer off into uh, the phone space with this, uh, I I had to go pick up my wife from the airport yesterday, and bec I I never thought I would end up using the Google Voice search, the Google Now Voice, but it was extremely useful when I was trying to find the status of her flight because I oh. would put in uh, I'll give it an example, and this is it, it's it's actually really uh, I was really surprised how well it works. So I'll do. I'm tempted to try this. Status on JetBlue flight three sixty four. JetBlue 
Highways 364 from West Palm Beach to New York is on time and departs in 42 minutes. I mean, that that's great. No, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, and and I was getting updates every you know couple you minutes. Know what Siri would say if you asked her that. Uh, I don't. I don't. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> Do you want me to call you Stephanie now? <laughs> I will now call you Stephanie. <laughs> I. Uh, you could have some famous actor in the ad acting like he just experienced magic for the first time. <laughs> yeah, Martin Sc- Scorsese is uh, very surprised yeah. at his Siri. He's How having do they fit a computer in this tiny box? Because it's not 1973 yeah, no anymore. Kidding. Yeah, open your eyes, Martin. Uh, we need to take a little break, and we need to talk about our sponsor, Audible.com, Paul. Okay. Uh, big fan of Audible.com, uh, the home of over 100,000 audiobooks uh, to choose from. It's, it's an unbelievable resource if you're into audiobooks, which I am. Uh, I'm into talk radio, and if I have nothing on my station, I'm listening to Audible in the car. Uh, great sele- selection of books from every possible genre you could imagine. Uh, Paul and I have been doing our Audible Picks of the Week. Well, mostly Paul because his picks are so good, I end up taking his picks and listening to them throughout the week. Uh, sometimes longer because some of these picks, uh, they're many hours. But this week, you uh, you have a couple of picks, right, Paul? I have several picks. Several picks, and I'm I, actually I, <laughs> really happy about them. Yeah, these are these are interesting ones. Um, I actually read this in paper form when I was in. Actually, I'm sorry, I read it in a Kindle, but I read the book book version of this. I reread it. Um, Different Seasons by Stephen King is a collection of novellas. Um, three of these were made into movies, and so uh, when if you get them on Audible, there each of the stories is available separately, and um, as their own, you know as their own book. Um, the first three are the ones that were made into movies. In fact, I think. The third of them was made into two different movies, if I'm not mistaken. But the first one, the movie version is called The Shawshank Redemption, of course, which is probably one of the best movies ever made. Amazing movie, yeah. The story that's in the book is actually called Rita Hayworth and The Shawshank Redemption. Oddly enough, the the audible version is just called The Shawshank Redemption, um, probably to, you know, uh, because people would search for, you know, that's how they think of it now. Um, The second one is called The Body. And The Body was also made into another excellent Stephen King movie called uh, Stand by Me, and that's the story about the four kids yeah, yeah, walking yeah. on the train. To, that's actually called the body because they discover a body uh, one day while they're out and about, and it, it, you know it's it's one of those Stephen King. You know, there's there's a lot of um, kind of archetypes in his stories, and the archetype here is uh, groups of kids who are friends and share this special relationship, both when they are children, but also later when they're adults, even if they live separately from each other in different parts of the country. And the body has aspects of that. Um, the third one is actually uh, kind of a neat uh, German World War II tie-in called App Pupil. Uh, this is about a kid who begins to suspect and then figures out that uh, an older guy who lives in his neighborhood is, in fact, a Nazi war criminal. So he decides to blackmail him. Oh, my God. <laughs> I yeah, gotta, gotta, I'm going to get this one right now. That's actually. a crazy one. Yeah, it's a good one. And if this one, as far as the movie stuff goes, I want to say that the original movie maybe never made it out. I, I want to say... Ricky Schroeder was in it, and I don't know. I don't know if he died or, or if something happened. They did. I don't know that. I don't. I don't think the original movie version ever came out. But they did eventually make a pretty decent movie of this story. Uh, probably not uh, not anywhere as famous as the other two. And then the third one, uh, the fourth one rather, which is actually my favorite story in the group in some ways, is called the Breathing Method. And um, this one I don't believe was ever made into a movie, um, or even as part of a movie, uh, like a compilation type movie. But it, it's about a it's basically about a woman who is giving birth and dies while that happens. And it's some kind of a horrific event or whatever, but it's, it's kind of the creepiest uh, of the stories and the most uh, like a horror story. The other ones are not actually horror stories. So a uh, very cool. I'm actually going to get the, uh, the world, the Nazi one. Yeah. I'm very <laughs> a, interested in that. It's a good one. I want to say, I should look this up. I, I suspect Max von Sydro was the German guy in the, uh, what year does it take place? Uh, it's probably the seventies or early 1980s, something like that. So let's see. It is, who is in it? Uh, that looks, oh, actually it's Ian McKellen. Oh, very cool. As the, uh, as the ex-Nazi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it really? takes place in 1980, Southern California. Let's, uh, let's get a little, uh, preview of it. Dude, when he grew up. All right, all right, the man who was pretending to be Arthur Denker called querulously. 
I'm coming, let it go, I'm coming. Todd stopped pushing the doorbell button. A chain and bolt rattled on the far side of the windowless inner door. Then it was pulled open. An old man hunched inside a bathrobe stood looking out through the screen. By the way, Frank Mueller does all the narrations. Yes, he does. uh, And he's phenomenal. He does all the Stephen King books. I should also point out, uh, in case there are any fans of this man, uh, Rick Schroeder is not dead. Uh, but they did. They did try to make a movie version of it with him, and uh, it eventually came to a halt because of uh, money problems. And so it's it was. It, there were people who were going to play the war criminal, like uh, James Mason and then Richard Burton, but they died, and they couldn't make it. So this movie had kind of a trouble, you know, a troubled beginning. Very interesting. I'm looking here at the uh, the book. I'm trying to find get more information. But very cool picks, Paul. And, of course, you could download this for free. If you go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash Andrew, uh, audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew, you could sign up and get your free audio book. Uh, and I think it's a great way to use up the free credit because uh, these books will give you a lot of, lot of entertainment. Uh, seven hours. Uh, this one uh, that I'm looking at right now, and that, that's kind of worth it for me. Uh, AudiblePodcast.com slash Andrew. Get your free audiobook. And thank you, Audible, for uh, supporting What the Tech. I think they support Paul and not me. They're Paul supporters, <laughs> not Andrew supporters. That's why they have to make me feel good with the promo code. Uh, I do want to go into some stuff happening in uh, the news. Uh, <laughs> there was some big news last week, and that was the uh, Apple-Samsung trial. Well, the first trial uh, has come to a close. I'm right. sure Samsung will appeal this, but Apple was awarded a judgment of 1.4 billion dollars, and Actually, now it's, so it's 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 1.04. So it's oh, 1.04. Yeah, it's like a billion basically. A bit, let's say yeah. Let's let's go with a billion. Uh, and but they're saying with the punitive damages, right? It could be three times as much. So th- there's a lot of screwy stuff about this trial, which I don't think is over. I mean, I no. realize that there's been a judgment or whatever. I mean. Aside from the obvious stuff, like there are going to be appeals, which there will be. Uh, Samsung has vowed to appeal this all the way to the Supreme Court, which I'm, well, I was just going to say, which I'm sure we'll never want to hear this case. But actually, this is a fairly important case. And so, you know, we'll see if it goes that far. There's some of the weird stuff that I would just point out is that, I don't know if you recall this, but when this was starting out, the the judge had made a comment. Uh, She said that if the jury did not, if she didn't agree with the jury verdict, that she would just override it and come up with her own verdict. Yeah. Now, that's strange, and I don't understand the legal implications of that or how. Well, that she was work. a character throughout the entire but, trial. But here's the thing: she provided Apple with a preliminary injunction early on in the trial against the Samsung Galaxy Tab 10.1, I think it was, the tablet. Of all the things that Samsung was found guilty of, one of them was not copying the iPad with their tablet. In fact, it was the one of the seven items that they were they were exonerated on. Okay. So she had already provided a preliminary, inju- a, pre- a preliminary injunction against a product that was found during the trial not to be infringing on Apple patents. And so, of course, Samsung came back and said, okay, so obviously you're going to let that one go, right? But that suggests to me that this judge was ready to come down really hard on Samsung from the beginning, you know, and that I'll tell you the funny thing. A lot of Apple users were screaming that this judge was corrupt. <laughs> well, that and the other part, though, that, by the way, that could be we should we should visit that. one. I don't know. Yeah. Anything, but, um, this was a really quick judgment. Wasn't Very it? Very quick. I, I mean, given the complexity just, just yeah. of the form those people had to fill out. Oh, that, I, have, that alone would have taken five days. Yeah, I was very surprised. And and yeah. one of our one of our viewers, uh, he he practices patent law, mm-hmm. and you know he was he, I I was talking to him about the case, and he was saying that you know a lot. This is complicated stuff. There there's no there's a lot of gray zones in this. Yeah. Uh, but I was I personally I don't know if he was surprised that the judgment was uh was was done so quickly, but. I personally was. I thought it would drag out for another two or three weeks. I did so um, because you want to you want to provide an unassailable opinion. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I, to me, that seems like that would be the point. One In of the words, biggest questions I've had, Paul, and I don't know if anybody's addressed this. If if it was published, I, I would love to know. But I yeah. wonder what kind of screening they did for the jury, and if 
they asked them what type of phones they use. Okay, so actually, allow me to introduce another topic into this discussion of things that are weird about this trial. Exhibit C. Exhibit C is, and this will be a familiar refrain because I, I kind of bring this kind of thing up a lot. In my little sub-genre of life where I cover technology for a living, I, I, of course, wake up in the morning and I read the newspaper. And I read what other people write about the industry that I'm sort of part of on the periphery. And I'm always amazed at the weird biases that I see in articles written by some people and some publications and whatever. And the week, uh, actually, it was just a few days before this ruling was handed out. Apple, I'm sorry, Samsung received a very favorable ruling in, um, in South Korea. And the South Korean court ruled that Samsung was not copying Apple's designs and uh, that they would not have to, uh, you know, have an injunction against the sale of their products. The way that that was reported here was that Samsung only got a favorable uh, verdict there because it was their home country. Yeah, you're right. Now, when, when you have a, a federal court in California, in San Jose, California, which, by the way, is like 10 minutes from Apple's headquarters, how, how do you not... I, I never saw anyone suggest that a Apple got a, a favorable hometown verdict. You know, they yeah. got the hometown bump, you know? But that's what they said about Samsung, you know? I'm not saying it is or isn't. I mean, I, I would like to think that people in California are smart enough that they can... And by the way, you have been one that has said that Android has single-handedly ripped Apple off. Oh, listen, I, I, want mean, to be very, I want to be very clear about this. There is no doubt that Samsung looked at Apple and said, we need to copy this. We product. need to do this right there's, now. There's no yeah. doubt about that. that. But that's not... But see, that's the thing. This kind of copying occurs everywhere in every industry. Um, I mentioned a company called Levitron that probably no one has ever heard of. They make electrical equipment. I can assure you that Levitron, if they've innovated anywhere and created some unique product, that their competitors, who may be like GE and Lutron and other companies, have copied them and made their own versions of those products. Yeah, and, we're, we're, and when vice we're, versa. Yeah, and when we're talking about, I mean, certain aspects, I, I could see certain things being patent. You know, they have the patent on it, and yeah, Samsung took it. But I mean, we're talking about rounded edges at certain points. Yeah, I mean, you know, some, I, some of the things that Apple took very seriously, which I think a lot of us would be like, what? It's like this notion of we're going to make a tablet, which by definition is going to have a, a rectangular screen. And so the device itself is going to be rectangular, but it's going to have rounded corners. Like Apple, there's no way that Apple can own that shape. There's just no way. And yet they kind of sort of do, don't they? <laughs> you yeah, know? they do. I mean, um, absolutely. It doesn't really make any sense. So I, I don't know. It, it's a tough one because, you know, before this verdict came out, if you had asked me, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, I would have said there's no doubt that Samsung has copied Apple. I get that. Uh, the question is whether they're liable for that or whether there's some kind of a, a damages associated yeah. with it. Obviously, it behooves Apple. Well, whatever documents that they had, I mean, that jury got, I mean, one of the judgments was that they knowingly, intentionally tried to cause harm to Apple by copying what they were doing. Now, I mean, the well, word yeah, of course, that, well, that's the job of every company. That's the job that of every company. Yeah. So if you read that, that you it say, sounds, well, it sounds like he's a serial killer when you yeah. describe it that way. They knowingly Actually, made round the edges. This is, this is slightly off topic, but I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, <laughs> someone, I, I was trying to explain to someone recently, very recently, how, my feelings about Android and, and how I thought that Google had arrived at the UI for Android, which I think is a mess of just conflicting ideas and, you know, whatever. And I, what I compared it to was, did I ever tell you the story about Quick Burger? Have I told you this no, story? No, no, no. So there's a French fast food chain called Quick Burger. And it's sort of like McDonald's, but everything is wrong, right? In other <laughs> words, there's a burger and it's on bread, but the rest of it is completely wrong. And so the way that I describe uh, Quick Burger to people is I say, clearly what happened was somebody from France visited the United States and went to a McDonald's. And he said, holy crap, this thing is incredible. We got to make one of these in France. But instead of taking pictures or writing down notes or getting a copy of the menu, he just came home and he worked off of his memory. <laughs> and what he can, and it, it's weird. It's like weird combinations of condiments and side orders. And it's, it's bizarre. And that's what Android is. Android is like they didn't even care to do a good job of ripping it off. It, someone at Google was like, all right, all right. So this is an iPhone, right? And there's like a grid of icons on the front of it, right? Well, let's, let's make one of those. 
and it runs apps and they're like full screen. Yeah, okay, let's do that. You know, here it it's is. Like, by it's the way, so, it's so poorly, poorly here's, done. Here's Quick Burger. Yeah, try try to find one of those sandwiches. It's uh, in English. Why is it in English? Yeah, interesting. Uh, history of taste. The history of taste. Well, let's find out your history of taste. There's not really much of a history there. No. The one thing, by the way, the one fun, the one nice thing about Quick Burger is, uh, if you have kids, you know that you can go to a McDonald's and you can get like a Happy Meal, and the Happy Meal includes a toy, and that toy is the cheapest piece of crap plastic that you'll ever find in your entire life. Yeah, it's, people it's, people bank their retirement on these toys. They're worthless. Yeah. When you go to Quick Burger and you get a their version of a Happy Meal. It comes with an incredible game, like a really nice one. Like we, uh, this is years ago now, but we got one time, the kids got like this board game that included all these plastic chips and pieces and stuff. And it unfolded into some giant thing that you could put on the floor. And you could have sold that thing in the United States for 20 bucks. Like I have no idea. It was almost like, well, yeah, we got to have a game for the kid. And the, you know, they were like a game, like, you mean like a nice game? Like, yeah, it was a, it was a game, <laughs> you know? So they have a game. I don't know. They, it does. The burgers do look a little off. They're off when you eat them. It's, it's you know, because the you sort of recognize it as a hamburger with bread and some other stuff, but it's the taste. You're like, what? You eat it and you're like, uh, hmm. You know, like, what is in this thing? Well, they, yeah. have, they have the Dark v Vader burger. Nice. The Dark Vader, the Dark Burger, the, the Jedi burger. Nice. I want all of them. Because Star Wars is still very much a current event. Why is it the Dark Vader? The Dark Vader? Yeah, dark. Maybe they call it Dark Vader. and I don't know. Bizarre. No, but you're, you're right. I mean, can McDonald's take a patent out the way that their buns look? Well, that's okay. So, right. In other words, today, uh, depending on where you live in the country, obviously, this Burger King is the big one. But there's, you know, Jack in the Box and, I don't know, Carl's Jr., whatever there is. There's all these different places where you can um, buy very similar sandwiches, right? Uh, no one has patented this stuff. I mean... McDonald's probably has a patent on a machine that efficiently squirts ketchup onto something in an exact pattern and size and shape that Burger King can't copy. And that's the type of thing I think when you think about technology patents, I think that's the type of thing we imagine. Ketchup, you know. No, I mean like something technical. Yeah. Not that there are uh, like seeds on the top of the bun. Or something, you know, so something that's very common that the the hamburger is round. You know, McDonald's never went to uh, Wendy's and said, you have to make a square hamburger, even though actually they do. You know, that wasn't the result of patent litigation. It was, you know, it was just whatever they did that. You know, it's probably more efficient to make. It's it like in uh, Coming to America, McDowell's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite movies. It takes place in Queens, by the way. Queens, New York. No, I, it, it is fascinating. Now, the... the the bigger story here is what's going to happen because of this judgment. Right. Now, they're appealing it. And, yeah. the, I mean, technically, the judge could get this in the appeals court and just throw this thing, whole thing out. That is never going to happen. And say, there's no way you're getting a billion dollars. You're crazy. Let's, I don't let's see forget that. about I really this. Don't. Or what they might end up doing is just settling. There's they no, might. Well, so, oh, but see, I actually, I. Honestly, I didn't think it was going to go this much in Apple's favor. I actually thought these guys were going to take two weeks and come back with something that was fairly mixed because it's a very complex topic. Um, they didn't do that. So Samsung, I'm sure, wants a settlement. Apple does not. But I think the one thing that Apple, in other words, from Apple's perspective, why would you settle? They don't need the money, right? The billion dollars means nothing to either company. It means nothing. I'm curious on how much they spent on litigation, both companies. Combined. Well, but in other words, if, if Apple in good faith actually wanted to license those patents to Samsung, which I think we all agree they really didn't, but let's pretend they do. I mean, how much are they worth? How many years would go by before that would equate to a billion dollars? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But I think if, if Samsung went and said, look, you know, let's just settle this and we'll, we will license that stuff. I don't think Apple would want to do it in some way that would make sense financially for Samsung. Now, here's the fascinating thing. You know, Android is not in violation of these patents. Android, well... Actually, for the so most that, part. For the is, most I, part. I, that's a good way to put it. In fact, I think that's exactly the way Google said. Uh, Google didn't say uh, Android is not in violation. They said most of this ruling most of them, was yeah. for Samsung. I mean, um, some of the features that Apple complained about were very much... Android features, you know, the bounce effect as you rubber band at the end of a 
scrolling through a list. That's a, that's a Google, you know, it's an Android feature. Remember uh, the original Droid did not have pinch, pinch and zoom. zoom. Yeah. And the supposition at the time was because Apple had patented that. And then they added it later and it was like, maybe they won't notice. You know? They had to change the way that, actually what they did was they changed the actual functionality, the way that it works. So there was some weird thing that they had to change in the pinch and zoom to get it to work. Without violating I mean, pinch the and zoom is very common. Um, Microsoft obviously has it in all of their products, but of course Microsoft has a cross licensing agreement yeah. with Apple. Maybe that's part of it. And you know that might have been the best thing that ever happened to Microsoft was that cross licensing agreement because they did not have these round icons, these, these squared icons on their on their desktop. You know so, the the device. Yeah, uh, I you know it's right. I, I mean. But that's nutty too. I mean, I'm going to allow you to license these certain features of my phone, but you cannot compete with me. That's what Apple told them. You're not competing well, uh, because you're not putting out the similar device. Okay, but on the flip side, Apple's not competing with Microsoft either, right? I mean, um, you got to remember that goes both ways. This wasn't Microsoft, you know, knelt down in front of Apple and promised to be good. I mean, they they this is a cross licensing. Yeah, they, they've agreed not to copy each other. Um, I would argue and have argued actually now that um, this also means that iOS can never be a good, as good as Windows Phone. So, good. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that that's an important part of this as well. Apple can't copy Microsoft. You know, um, I don't know what that entails exactly because it's not, it's not as uh, black and white as we both just made that sound. Um, it means very specific things. You know, so Apple owns certain patents, Microsoft owns certain patents. They have cross-license them, that means they are, in fact, copying each other. They're, they're using patented technology. So I think we could argue that uh, the pinch-to-zoom stuff and the, uh, the effect that, you know, you scroll through a list and it bounces when you hit to the end, uh, those things are in Windows 8. They're in Windows Phone. They're okay because they've cross-licensed that. But I think the copying bit has more to do with, like, the design of it. You know? Yeah. Apple just applied for a patent for something that looks very much like the Microsoft Surface tablet. Well, Apple just got the patent for uh, the way that you submit a podcast. <laughs> Great. Uh, I mean, in th that whole concept behind it, I'm, I'm putting a post on my other you know website. What? So and please include this phrase. Someone has finally figured out how to make money from podcasting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Thank God, about time, yeah, right? About, yeah, I, knew, I knew it was in there somewhere. I'm trying to find the article because we're making the post on the uh, IIB website. I just got to find it now because I didn't write the article. Uh, I can't find it. But it, it's it's the way that you're able to submit a certain uh, podcast to a directory. But if you look at it, it pretty much says that they control any kind of podcast directory. Like if you read the wording, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll read that submitting a talk format audio file to a directory is now Apple's. And I, I find that interesting, but I mean, obviously, they're not going to—they're not going to go after you know Joe Schmo that has a little podcast website. You remember when podcast started as a term? The big problem was that Apple didn't like it because it was their word. It was pod, yeah. Um, uh, they were granted twenty-nine patents. Uh, the improved technology that Apple has patented to run a. This site is saying a whole lot of nothing. I'll tell you this. <laughs> Oh, they're not explaining anything anything from this they're talking about disney now okay that was a waste of a website uh, but pretty much they, they they got this 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 patent on the way that podcasts are submitted to an app store and i find that really interesting that they're, they're going after that right um i'm trying to find yeah so they're showing it, it's pretty much the submission process no one, no one had apps before apple invented them so i don't know why that's a problem yeah, very. It's all interesting <laughs> stuff. I mean, listen, the patent stuff, the patent litigation stuff, it is yeah. interesting and not. I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired well, of hearing about it because these big companies are now crying and they're suing each other over this. But technically, you know what? It's their patent. They own it, and if a company's in violation of the patent, they're in violation of the patent. I this is tough for me because I, you know, I, I mean, I create content. I, I sort of get the ownership thing, and I don't like to see my stuff ripped off by people, which I see all the time. Um, I do feel like companies should be able to own, you know, intellectual property or whatever. You know, like I get it. Like I understand why there are these things. But on the flip side, I also know that the system is so totally broken, when it, especially when it comes to technology. Because I think the technology is moving so fast that the U.S. Patent and Trade Office has no idea 
what it's doing. And yeah. it's, it's giving patents to people or to companies, I should say, that don't deserve them. Well, you know, you, it, it you, doesn't understand. It doesn't move quickly enough to recognize prior art. I mean, know? obviously, there has to be some sort of patent reform with the way that these software patents are being given out. Because does it does it actually I mean does it cause innovation or does it hurt innovation? That's also the the question here. Because in Microsoft's term, it did cause innovation because their their mobile operating system looks nothing like anybody else's. What would have happened if you know Microsoft, let's say, put out Windows oh, Phone Seven okay. and so it was? I, you're assuming that that's why that happened. I, I mean, I, let's I, say, yeah, let's go with the assumption there. Yeah, I minute. don't know. I, I actually don't know either way. I'm not saying that's not true. I mean, I, this cynically, you could sort of say, well, they only did it like that because they had to, you know. Um, well, I think they I did that way the because fact that it happened, regardless of the why, because what they came up with was, was something that I would describe, and I, I, I always say that that I have described as. Something that is not just different to be different, but something that is, in fact, just better, you know, that is, is thoroughly thought through. I mean, that's part of the problem I have with the Android stuff, you know, that it is so blindly copied from something else. And that's really the quick burger joke, right, that they don't even really understand what they're copying. They just know they have to have something that looks just like this other thing. And it's they're amazing because really, now they have majority of the, the mobile share. Yeah, it's, it's it, right. And, and it's, fun, you know, again, it's ironic or hypocritical that I, I sort of look at this with a sense of indignation. When I also support the flip side of that, which is what happened in the PC space, when the PC makers basically ripped off each other in the Apple and created this kind of market of clones, you know, that exists to this day. They sold, they sold 385 million of these things last year. Um, it got better over time. Android has certainly gotten better over time. Yeah. Um, but there is, I, 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 I don't agree with Apple slash Steve Jobs very often, but, you know, his sort of self-righteous indignation over Android, I have to say, I actually get it. I, I really do get it. Yeah, but we're also in the infancy of this technology. You know, mobile, the mobile, te the mobile uh, ecosystem is, is just evolving. No, no, of course. But that's evolving. It's a, so it's going to it's going to no, be but, existing. People are going to copy each other. That's why it's important. Because this happened before. In other words, Apple, Apple did not invent the mouse and the GUI and all that kind of stuff. But they were the first company to bring it to market in a mass market system that was aimed at actual human beings, not at huge companies. And they put it out in the world. And they got shamelessly ripped off, shamelessly ripped off. And, um, and then they lost, you know, they lost. That was the end of it. I mean, uh, they had, they actually had to settle with Microsoft because they needed, you know, they, they needed a lot of things at that time, but they settled with Microsoft. They lost. And so this was Apple's attempt is Apple's attempt to prevent this from happening again in this market. You can, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Android is playing the role of the PC. It's exactly the same thing. They're just shamelessly ripping them off. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Samsung, as the world's biggest maker of smartphones, is obviously the the company you go after. I mean, I, I, in this case, it actually makes some sense. It, it's it's crazy to say this, but in, in this in this mobile you know world where you know it's it's Android versus Apple, you know Microsoft is there, but they 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 don't have the market share at all. I mean, they're a couple of years behind, but currently it's Android versus Apple. Well, but you have Apple, to show you have to sh the the reason they call them damages is you have to show. The injury to the company that has occurred because of this company and, you're and, complaining about, and you know what, Samsung it's very sells easy. more than anybody. That is exactly that is why they go after it. it. Even if Microsoft and Apple didn't have this cross licensing agreement, let's say uh, Microsoft had come up with Windows Mobile 8.0, and it was like a complete iPhone ripoff, which frankly is not too hard to imagine. Um, he, you know, you wouldn't really go after Microsoft because they don't really sell enough of these things. Yeah. There's no real damage there. It's like pathetic. It's like, you know. They're not hurting us at all. They make us look good. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you look at look at Apple versus Android. Look at iOS versus Android. Apple is the underdog here because they put out one phone a year. You have, <laughs> well, you but have. That, okay, but no, but it, that's not. That, you can't say that's why. That's their decision. That's I mean, their decision to do it. Yeah, but I mean, they're not the big dogs in this. Yeah, I mean, if you compare, you know, phone to phone, yeah, they they they're still the dominant phone, but they have a lot of competition ahead of them. And if sure. if I was Apple and, you know, it's the infancy of this technology, I'm the first to kind of put this out there and be successful at it. You know what? I understand why they're going after Samsung. If you um, were to go into a, a neighborhood in some city in this country or in some other country, it doesn't matter. And you could go to like a quickie mart type of place. And in the in the in the window, you might see a, a terribly painted Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or some other copyrighted trademark character of the Disney Corporation. And every time I see something like that, I think to myself, 
how is it possible that they can do this and get away with this? But of course, the reason is Disney's not going to go after that little corner shop because there's no money to be had from it. They, yeah. they can't prove that they've been damaged by this. Um, if a rival movie company were to put out a movie featuring a, a, a little animated animal that looked just like Mickey Mouse, Disney would sue the crap out of that company. Yeah, the main point of the entire argument that Apple has is, are people going into stores and being, and, confused. And being yeah. confused? And you know what? I guarantee you... It does happen, and not. I don't sure. think it happens anymore. I think initially when the iPhone came out, people started calling the smartphones iPhones. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, honestly, uh, the other thing Apple wants to avoid is this notion of commodity that it doesn't really matter which one of these things you buy. You know, yeah. um, and honestly, unfortunately for Apple, I think that is where we're heading. I mean, I you can look at what happened in the PC industry. Um, there are certain advantages to doing all of your stuff by yourself, like Apple does. There are certain advantages to having a, a rich partner ecosystem where each of these companies can innovate in different ways. And, you know, obviously it's a two-edged sword. I mean, PC makers put crap on their PCs, but they also come up with some innovative designs. And, you know, you can make that choice as a consumer. Um, Apple's decision to make one phone a year is Apple's decision. I mean, uh, another company would have done this very different. Apple does things in a very, you know, in a very unique way. It's just the way they but do it. But if they it, hadn't, so. you know, let's say if Apple hadn't done this and let's say it was Microsoft that did this, would they yeah. would they be fighting over, you know, patents right now? Or it would be a totally different, you know, mobile uh, world? Uh, who? We, uh, who? Let, let's say it was Microsoft that was in Apple's position currently and, Sam, you know, would they go after a Samsung? You know, it all, that also comes into play it's, too. It's kind of, yeah, so, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, there's this, um, it's kind of this weird assumption in the world that Apple invents everything and Microsoft rips them off all the time. Uh, Apple is and was the underdog in the PC space. Apple ripped off a lot of Windows features from Mac OS X. I'm sorry if that's confusing, sure, but it's and, true. And you know what, Sometimes Linux they even gave them the exact same names, uh, fast user switching, for example. Um, Wasn't there a whole thing about the recycling bin? What was the deal with the recycling? I don't, I don't remember the exact. I mean, OS2 had a shredder, like a paper shredder thing. It was stupid. But the, the point is, Microsoft is never going to sue Apple over that stuff. They don't have to. Yeah. Because Apple doesn't have any kind of market share. Enough of a threat for them to bother. In fact, when you're a monopoly, you kind of want to keep those guys kicking around. They're help, they're, yeah. That's very helpful to have. You can point to them and say, look, we do have competitors. Aren't they cute? Let me pat him on the head and give him a piece of cheese or something. <laughs> you know. the, but in the, obviously in the devices space, this thing is completely reversed. It's Microsoft that is the, 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 the tiny underdog, you know. Um, so for now, you know, I think Microsoft, uh, well, of course, they have a cross-licensing agreement. I don't think Microsoft has anything to worry about. And in fact, I think it behooves Apple as this market grows and grows and grows that as, if they are the number two player and that's their lot in life, they're looking great. Yeah. I, I mean, they've, they've got, they're the biggest company on earth. I mean, uh, there's no problem there. But they do just have to make sure that they don't let what happened in the PC space happen again here. Th that's really what this they're is They're hanging about. on. Yeah, this, they, they don't want to lose there's it. There's no belief that they will beat Samsung in, in the market. You know, I don't think that is the point. You know, one quarter every year, Apple comes out with a big product. And for that one quarter, Apple outsells Samsung. The rest of the year, Samsung yeah. outsells them. Apple does it with one product. Samsung, Samsung does it with like 170. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These are completely different ways of doing business. If you love Apple, you kind of scorn the Samsung approach. If you're a little tired of Apple, you just kind of you kind of cheer Samsung on. You know, it doesn't matter. It's like Yankees versus Red Sox, or you know, what, however you want to look at it. it. It's just you like what you like. They have different approaches. They're different companies. They do things differently. Whatever. I don't really. I actually. I, I to me, Apple does create strong feelings of love or hate. No, sure. <laughs> so I, I believe to me, it. Samsung yeah. is like what? It's like Samsung. What are they? Like, I don't think anybody make? has any kind of lo like. If you think about well, brand like Samsung, loyalty, like, what do they make? Like refrigerators? I mean, who, yeah. the, who is this company? And they're I, I don't, they're a fairly new company. I mean, Samsung w w did not put out high end quality, you know, products in the past. But I Samsung makes great HD TVs. Uh, one of the things I noticed years ago was that if you went to a Microsoft event and they were trying to show off some kind of an HD thing with an Xbox or whatever, it was always Samsung displays. And that led to me buying one for my Xbox, which I love. It works fantastically. Um, I just last week bought a Samsung 
laptop at the Microsoft store because I had had another Samsung laptop and I think it's fantastic. And God, talk about copying. Yeah. I mean, this thing's a rip off of the MacBook Air. Of course. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, yeah. I'm curious on if they own any. It, it, I would love to see it. I'm sure there's just some document like what their design pattern is on the MacBook Air. Yeah. I and don't if know. that's going to be an issue because all these, you know, you can't ultra books are going to come out. Everyone makes clamshell laptops, you know, um, everyone's going to want to have thin laptops. If you, I don't know if you're familiar with this computer, but you know, three years ago I bought for my wife a Dell Vostro. Yes, yes, yes. Whatever it's called. It, it, at the time, it sort of represented what was kind of thin and light. It was based on the, the year or two before his design of what used to be called that Adamo computer they had. Yeah. And at the time, that thing was like shockingly beautiful from a style perspective. Yeah, it was a high end, you know, yeah. luxury computer. Her computer today weighs at least twice as much as mine does. It is easily three times as thick, you know, and now she's looking at this and thinking, wow, it's only been a couple of years, but Look this that. thing is really out of date. And so I think as we move toward these thinner, lighter, you know, more portable systems, it's, it's hard to make something that's flat and thin. That's a laptop that doesn't look a lot like the MacBook Air. I mean, there are some different designs. I think some of the HP stuff looks good. Um, you know, Asus has Asus started off really ripping off the. MacBook Air, but I think the new version they've kind of you know uh, ironed that out a little bit, you know. Um, but th they're all basically going to kind of look like that, right? You need to have yeah. a, a thick part that where you can have a USB. Well, port. that's just the evolution of the product. You know, the evolution of this device is becoming thinner uh, overall and and slicker designs. But sure. you know, at what point do you say, well, yeah, it's getting thicker, thinner, but it's copying this this device? I, it, it, there's a really fine line. I mean, the same thing with the rounded edges. You know, is that the evolution of the product line or is that a direct copy of what Apple was putting or someone else was putting? Right. Uh, well, you know, a Apple released a MacBook Air before the MacBook Airs we all think of as MacBook Airs, right? There was a, a first generation machine that was woefully underpowered. I think it had like one USB port or something. It had that weird little flip down panel with the other ports and it was really expensive and nobody bought it. And nobody ripped off that thing. In fact, no. I, think, I think when that Dell Adamo came out, it was sort of like Dell's response to that MacBook Air. And frankly, it looked really nice. You know, like Dell at that time actually had the better design. I can't begin to tell you how many people I know that bought that first MacBook Air and, and returned it. <laughs> yeah. It's it was just, utterly well, useless. It was just not usable as your only computer and too expensive to be like a companion device. Yeah, it, it was their answer to the netbook, I think. Yeah, you know that that, that was, was there. But it, I think it cost like twenty eight hundred bucks. Yeah, it was insane. really expensive. It was insane. So obviously, with the second gen design and now the third gen, which is the same body, you know, newer parts, uh, they clearly got something very, very right. I mean, that machine is beautiful to look at, is nice and light, and it's great. It's just great. Really cool stuff, Paul. And of course, we, we could discuss patent this patent stuff for hours <laughs> because sure. it's so much. Uh, so many layers to all of it, but uh, we should do our what if of the week. Okay. Uh, every week we do a what if in technology. What if, uh, you know, so-and-so bought this company? Uh, last week, I believe we did what if the iPhone didn't come out? Yep. Poorly, probably, but yes. I don't remember. Uh, this week we're going to do what if Windows Longhorn actually got released? Because we've discussed actually, Longhorn <laughs> multiple times on the show, yeah, uh, yeah. and it it seems like I always thought uh, I was one of the only ones that kind of gripped onto this operating system. It was like, wow, oh, look no. how beautiful it is. But when I when I met Paul, one of the first discussions we had was about Windows Longhorn and what a uh, a great step into the right direction it was for Microsoft at the, at the time coming That's out right. of Windows XP. It was leaving this dated look and it was stunningly beautiful and uh, it had a lot of integration with music and file and and video and uh, yep. it was just it was just the operating system of the future. And the device and the operating system never came out. We got a a you know skimmed down version of it known as Windows Vista, which led to Windows XP, which uh, Windows Seven, yep. and now we're at Windows Eight, which is a total overhaul. But what would have happened if Longhorn actually came out? What what would have been the next ten years? This is, this of is this going operating to be contrary system? to everything that anyone who knows me is going to think I'm going to say. Okay, because Longhorn was the biggest thing in the world at the time. Two thousand and three. Two thousand three. You know, for the first couple of years, before we knew it wasn't going to happen. It was huge. Um, long, it's sort of like uh, if you're familiar with um, Portal, it's like, you know, Longhorn was a lie. 
Long, <laughs> Longhorn did not exist. No, never did. Longhorn was fake. Uh, Longhorn was a dream, and uh, it wasn't just the way it looked. It you know you, you, the the important part of Longhorn was that for the day, and this is like almost a decade ago, literally a decade ago. I mean, now. if you look at it now, it's a little dated looking, but of course. But I mean, you got to go back in time and think. Okay, the, Microsoft had do, had made the transition from the the Windows 9X stuff to Windows NT with XP. And this was their attempt of the day to make the, that next transition, to take the PC platform and take it to the next level. It was going to become so a full-fledged was, media consumption device. All kinds of stuff going on here. I mean, um, fixing the wrongs, you know, centralized uh, notification, sidebar stuff. But from an architectural standpoint, it was going to be a, da a relational database-based file system, um, which would have been incredible, you know, that kind of thing. I, I still... I, I, it's funny because we have, um, I, I think, what anyone who knows anything about this stuff would describe as lame replacements for that stuff now. But they really do work, and I think that's yeah. the important bit. But, yeah, Longhorn was really about Microsoft reaching for the stars and I think for the first time not achieving something they set out to do. And I think they were confused by how poorly it went. Not that there weren't things before Longhorn that failed. I mean, people should remember the Cairo project as well, which was – the original Longhorn in many ways, you know, this dream for NT, yeah, NTV2 yeah, yeah. Uh, that never happened, you know, and, and uh, Cairo had its own uh, object-oriented. Uh, back then, the, the key phrases were object-oriented programming, and so it had an object-oriented file system was part of it, you know. Um, okay. The, the thing is, I, I, this is but it not a little be, nuts. But it not happening led to a lot of stuff. Yeah, so here's stuff. the thing. If Longhorn had happened... Microsoft would have been in far worse shape today to cope with the changes that have happened in the industry otherwise. Very interesting. Why? Because it would have wasted time creating this platform that it would then have had to support for years to come that was completely different than the platform it was replacing. Instead, you know, Vista, as far as, you know, we've talked about Vista and how uh, Vista is not as bad as people, you know, sort of generally think it is was not the, certainly the financial disaster that everyone seems to think it was. You know, this thing sold over 300 million copies a year. It did great. But, you know, Vista, frankly, was a mess. And, and what I mean by that is it had this, these weird vestigal parts of Longhorn in it, plus some other stuff that was kind of just kind of brand new. You know? Well, I mean, I, I think the core of, of the overhaul would have been that file management uh, system, the new file management system that they were going to put in right. place, and Windows how, and FS. How, and how freaking worthless would that be? In this day and age of cloud computing, yeah. where increasingly the amount of we have moved to a world now where the amount of storage you could get on a laptop went up, 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 and then it came f crashing back down. And when you look at all of these new uh, Surface tablets and Windows RT tablets, there are going to be devices that will ship with only 32 gigabytes of storage. The uh, mainstream on RT is probably going to be 64, maybe 128. And anyone who's bought a PC over the past two years knows that a mainstream laptop today or Ultrabook ships with a 128 gigabyte SSC. It just does. And if you want to, sh if you want to go up to 256, it's like three or four hundred bucks extra. Yeah, yeah, it's a big jump. It's a huge jump. It's expensive, and it's weird how things have changed. We the, uh, PCs are now, uh, courtesy of Windows 8, taking on a mobile device platform. It's a completely different thing. And I don't, Microsoft would not have been... Here's, here's, here's the thing. Microsoft was the most successful company on earth for two decades. And then they started failing. But through inertia... And I've written... By the way, I've written, actually written an editorial about this that hasn't appeared yet. But I'll just kind of paraphrase it. Through inertia, was able to kind of muddle through these failures and not have any huge, you know, problems. So even though Longhorn was the biggest crisis that had ever happened to that company, they kind of muddled through it. Windows 7 happened. You know, everything was okay. And if, and if the Apple stuff had never happened, if the Android stuff had never happened, you know, that would have been enough for the next yeah. you know, five, ten years, whatever. I, I think it's amazing that Microsoft today is responding finally to this crisis, this crisis that has not even happened yet, where they've looked forward and said, you know what? We are going to dominate the PC industry for the rest of our lives. But the PC industry is going to become an increasingly small part of the general purpose computing you know, market. And that these other devices, smartphones and tablets and hybrid devices, are going to make up a much bigger market. And we're not part of it. 
If Microsoft had been successful with Longhorn, they never would have been able to make this leap. See, I, I think if they were successful with Longhorn, uh, the operating system that we get today would be a lot closer to that sketch you had on your website. Ske oh, the thing I, yeah. Right. Yeah, like right. What, why because doesn't it look like this? they would never have been able to back away from this PC. Thing. No, no. And I think they would have been closer to what OS ten is. Yeah. It's still, by the way, it's still amazing that they're doing this. In fact, if you look at Mountain Lion or Lion, you know, the, the, the two most recent versions of OS ten. You know, I think those are the types of systems where that people would have expected of Microsoft, where you bring in ideas from the mobile space into Windows, because you know, oh, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, people have a uh, notification center on Android that we could use this in OS ten. You know, okay, that's cute, but honestly, what Microsoft did is so much more amazing. And by the way, they could fail completely. I mean, it's really interesting, but. Windows 8 is not Windows 7 plus a bunch of mobile tech. Windows 8 is a brand new mobile platform that has the Windows 7 desktop too. Yeah. It's the other way around. It's the, it's the mobile stuff that's important. It's Windows RT that's important. It's not Windows, it's not the Windows that we know it, you know? And I, I think the thing that people need to remember is that we think of this Windows thing as something, even though Windows has been different things. When Windows started out in the 1980s, Windows, Windows was simply a uh, a program launcher that ran on top of DOS. Yeah, it evolved right. in, into sort of an operating system. Um, Windows NT took over for Windows with Windows XP, but Windows 2000 as well, obviously Windows NT4. It just, they just modified it. It ran the same apps. It used the same drivers. No one knew any better. And we think of it as Windows. And now we're, we're making a similar transition to Windows RT which and that will are, be Windows. I mean, and that people are freaking out, but the truth is, it's just Windows. Yeah, it's just Windows, and it's a completely different platform. I mean, not not completely. Obviously, the core of it is still the NT core uh, that we've had, you know, since nineteen ninety three, really, but um, evolved. But I mean, uh, the differences between Windows R RT and Windows XP are as grand as the differences between Windows XP and Windows nine, you know, Windows three one. As are the differences between that and Windows 1.0. Yeah, you know, these I, things are all like Windows, but they really have nothing to do with. You know, all. a lot of a lot of people debate that this, the the criticism that Vista got would not have existed if Longhorn came out. But I think it's it would have been as bad as what I, Vista I, got because it would have been a total <laughs> overhaul to the way that the the the, the operating system works. Yeah. There would have been many features that probably didn't work. Or, or function properly, and they would have probably redone everything in Windows 7, just like they did in with Vista, and but we wouldn't be able to leave I, it because so much time was spent on this new way in, of doing Windows. In retrospect, it's obvious they could never have made Longhorn. It, 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 would, it wouldn't have it was, worked. It was never going to happen. And, and the way they were doing Longhorn, and the reason why, and, and this was that kind of mea culpa moment that Jim Alter had where he had to go to Bill Gates and explain that this thing they had been working on for five years was now not going to happen is that they had different teams working in a very, in a, arguably, in an object-oriented fashion, right? Uh, uh, doing their own little things. And they weren't talking, yeah. They weren't talking to each other because they, won't, they don't have to. Uh, these are different components, like whatever. But when they put it together, it was a freaking disaster. You know, you know who that sounds like now? No. It sounds much like, uh, uh, very similar to how Apple works. Oh, well, the bureaucracy in the company where, where everything uh, is kind of split off from each other. Development is done in totally different teams for everything. But, but they don't have to. They're not all working on one thing. I mean, no. the, the problem with Longhorn is there were, you know, 120 different groups working on different things that were going to go. They were, they were basically like, OK, everybody uh, sign in your code and we're going to hit compile and we're going to see what happens. And it was like, burr, 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 you know, probably broke the broke the build machine. I mean, it was just never going to happen. It was never going to happen. And so. They had to scale back dramatically on their plans. Well, I'll you know, tell you, you know, the, the future of Windows, uh, and and we'll and we'll you know get ready to uh, wrap it up. But the future of Windows is is in this device that uh, Sony's going to be releasing. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you saw it in the notes. Yeah. But uh, there's this hybrid tablet that Sony will be probably unveiling within the next week or so, and this is what the future of the PC is. Regardless if you if you know you agree with me or not, but this is kind of where it's headed. Uh, there's no way that the desktop version of Windows will be the feature of that operating system, and that's it's going to be point. phased and out. The and this is the well, it, you know, I, I I sort of expect there'll be like a desktop thing there for a while, right? I mean, obviously the Metro stuff has to evolve. Um, 
but yeah, this picture you've got in the show notes, it's a looks like one of those Clio devices from years ago running Windows CE where yeah. they kind of a small keyboard um, with a big screen sitting on top of it. Um, I look at that and I think I can't type on that thing. I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to get work on done, done on that. But I'm a writer and most people are not writers. And most people, you know, yeah, could. I, 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 my wife is moving to Windows 8. And so I sat down with her and I said, look, I want you to have a legitimate Windows 8 experience. You got to come to me if you have questions. But I do want to show you a couple of things up front. And um, it's interesting, as I was describing the little interfaces in Windows 8, it occurred to me that these things are all very much more natural on a touch-based device. And I grabbed the tablet I had and I was like, see, just so you understand why it looks the way it looks, um, when you're holding a tablet and the, the buttons are down in the corners or whatever, that makes sense. When you're using a desktop computer and the, and the buttons are like three feet apart or something on the screen, it's like, that doesn't make any sense at all. And it, it, it's that kind of thing that has to be rectified because even if this is the future, and I think it is, you're right, I mean, for Windows, they need to make it so that it works right regardless of what kind of machine you have. Yeah. That's the diversity and the uh, the the um, the advantage of Windows. See, and let, let me just say one thing. The, the biggest flaw that uh, Windows RT has is multitasking, in my opinion. I think all I, kinds of flaws. By the way, so, so <laughs> someone just wrote, somebody just wrote, I, I, I will never do this again, but somebody just, somebody just wrote in the, show, in, the uh, in the chat room, I use a 27-inch monitor and Metro is fine on it, right? I use a 27-inch monitor too, but I have to say Metro is not fine on it. And the reason Metro is not fine on it is that if you use like the mail app and you go up and you click on a message, you right click on a message and now you want to move it to a different thing. You right click up way up in the corner. The move command is way down in the right. And then the thing you're going to move it to is way back over on the left. And those are things that they're going, and, to, they're going to have to fix. Yes. And, and I know that's just a single example, but that's the problem with these interfaces. Like the, if, when you're holding it, those things being on the sides of the screen are okay because you're like left, right, left, right. It's okay. But when you're just using one pointing device and you're moving it around, that's a lot of real estate to cover. Yeah. To do one, to do a something that uh, on the web interface for this exact same app, all you have to do is drag and drop it into another folder. It's a lot of ponderous work. So it's going to get better. It has to get better. The question is, you know, how, how long it takes. Yeah, and, and let me just touch on the uh, the desktop. I, I think desktop will be around, uh, but I don't think desktop in its current form will be around. The yeah. concept of what we consider desktop will, will be gone, uh, you know, within the next two versions of Windows. But the, 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 con, the, the core functionality of it will still exist in a way. I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm explaining myself properly, but... I think the, the, the what we know of desktop will be gone, but there will be a desktop type uh, like interface in Windows yeah, forever. I, I, but I, I think the success of this platform is going to require that either we are moving to ARM, you know, as a as a whole as an industry, or Intel gets its act together and they ship they do to their chips what they did for x sixty four, which is just kind of a, adopt not necessarily the exact technologies, but the the ideals of this world where you can have an Intel-based platform that's super thin, super light, crazy connected standby times, crazy battery life, excellent performance, and that awesome backwards compatibility. It's still very important to people. But, um, you know, nobody really talks about compatibility with DOS anymore. Nobody worries about the 16-bit apps that used to run on Windows 95 too much anymore. Um, these things all sort of fall off the face of the earth. And so as we move forward, there will be a version of Office, I'm sure, someday that runs in Metro. There'll be a version of uh, Photoshop that runs in Metro. Yeah. Um, these things are going to happen, and our reliance on these old-fashioned desktop apps will go away. And maybe in some future version of Windows, even people like me who work with a desktop and a keyboard and a mouse will spend most of their time now in that environment. And I think you mentioned uh, multitasking. I mean, they need to do something, you know, to, to make that yeah. better, too. Uh, to, before we wrap up, Paul, I want to ask you, I saw a blog post that you put up uh, about your next book. Oh, yeah. Uh, we haven't even released. Nice haven't job even preventing released. me from writing it, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you want to go into, do you want to tell us uh, what, what you're going to be doing? It's kind of a long story, but the, the, the long and the short of it is that um, I, I don't want to do another book like the books I've been doing. Right. Um, it is not. And I don't mean that like I don't like my publisher. I mean, I, the people there are great. I, um, you know, what they're doing is great and all that kind of stuff. But 
I, we live in this kind of fast moving world and things change. And one of the problems I have with the book is I spend a lot of time on it. I make a very little amount of money and then it's immediately out of date. And I want to do something that's more dynamic. And so this next book is an experiment. I want, I'm writing it about a topic I care deeply about Windows Phone 8. Um, I want to do it in uh, a, a sort of a collaborative format with readers. I want people to have access to the, this book as I write it. And by that, I'd, I mean, I'm not going to write eight chapters and then publish something. I'm going to, if I write some of it in a day, I'll put up a new version of the document that day and you'll be able to get it. And then over time, as it fills out, I want to get, you know, I want to get feedback from people about the writing, the content, the layout, the, you know, uh, how it's structured, the whole thing, and make it better as a result. I, I don't, I'm not going to charge for it. My goal is not to use like, uh, you know, other people's labor and then benefit from it. My goal is to make to sort of give something back to the Windows Phone community, which I care about deeply, and to Windows Phone in general, and uh, to write about something I really care about and see if this type of thing makes sense. And that the end game for this will be a book that anyone can get for free in any format they want, whether it's PDF, Word, EPUB, Mobi, whatever. If they want to print it out at Amazon and get a printed version of it on paper, they can do that. They, w they will have to pay for that. I mean, there's no way to get around that. Um, I want there to be an app version for Windows 8. I want there to be a mobile app version that runs on Windows Phone. I want it to be the whole thing. And then what, ha what will happen is, um, I don't want to make a joke about this, but at some point, um, Microsoft will update Windows Phone 8, and I'll be able to update the book, and it will always be up to date. It'll always you know? be. A, that's a great idea. Um, and that's the, that's the, well, there are a lot of problems I have with traditional book publishing. Um, some of it involves a schedule, which is sort of like the Army thing, you know, hurry up and wait. But... I don't want to have a situation where I publish something and Microsoft makes a change and I can't do anything about it. I hate that. And so this is my first attempt to do something different. I, I know other people have done slightly different things. You know, there are other authors who are doing things differently. Charles Petzold is a good example where he's publishing um, his programming Windows book through Microsoft Press and you can buy it early, get early copies of the books of the book and there'll be drops of it. So there was a consumer preview version, there was a release preview version, there'll be an RTM version. And that's great. I, I think that's fantastic. But what I want to do is not do that. I want to I want to I want people to see what it's like as it happens. I think it'll be interesting for people, but I also want uh, from myself to get pe feedback from people. You know, I write things in a certain way. And maybe that's not the best way. You know, I, I might structure this book in a certain way, but people will come back and say, well, actually, you know, why don't you do it like this instead? I mean, how are people going to give feedback to you? So that's an open question, too. So I have a, a website I've set up for the book um, called windowsphonebook.com. I don't even know what I'm going to call it. So the book that is um, right now, it's basically just uh, through the chat. I'm sorry, through the uh, comment section in there. I, I don't know that that's going to be the right way to do it. And so for now, that is the way it's going to be. Um, I think as I start publishing the book, um, I don't know if that's going to be adequate. I mean, we're going to see. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. And so um, one of the things I'm going to do is um, put up early versions of the table of contents or the, uh, you know, the layout, the, the structure of the book, see what people think about that, have people, you know, come back. Um, people have already raised a couple of issues I didn't think of, you know, early on. That's good. Um, I think the really interesting bit's going to be when the book is available and they'll be able to read parts of it, you know. And yeah. I don't mean like chapters necessarily. It'll be just like sections. I mean, someday I may be inspired to write like a little uh, how we got here to where we are today. It'll be like a history of Windows Phone. And, you know, people will chime in. and So, you, I mean, pretty much the, the, the reader is going to be able to either go to a blog and read it or download it, you know, via whatever. Yeah, I, I think for the very anymore. early bit, uh, for the first months probably, um, it will be... I don't think I'm going to like cut and paste it into the blog. I think I'm going to make a download available and it will be like word format or PDF format or something where people can go in and just read it, you know? And, um, you know, some people, some people may go in there with a, you know, the revision thing in word and make changes to the document and send it back. I don't know. You know, I, people can do it however they want. They can just read it and not do anything. I don't care. It doesn't really matter. Um, that's a great idea, Paul. I just want it to yeah. be, I want to see how it goes. We'll see. Because I, I mean, always I always imagine it's very difficult to write any kind of book based on Windows, uh, Windows Phone or Windows or even, even you know, Apple when, when a new version comes out. Because by the time you publish this thing, there are features that have been either removed or modified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you tell the user, oh, yeah, by um, the way, they changed so, this six months ago. Yeah, so Windows Phone is happening very quickly, right? Uh, this book won't be day and date. I mean, I, I roughly speaking, I would like to have this thing sort of done by January 1st, I guess, or whatever. But... 
Um, I do have early access to some code, and I, I, I have I, I, I have some some ways to block things out now. You know that maybe things that aren't necessarily public. I, I will say from sort of a, a structural standpoint that I have. Um, uh, we have private events that I have uh, notes from and, and public events as well. And I will, uh, I think people might be interested maybe, uh, in my notes and how I will, you know, people can go back and watch that windows phone summit video, for example, it's probably an hour, hour and a half of whatever. And then I will, I, I'm going to go back and watch it again. I actually took notes that day, but I'm going to go back, watch it again. I'm going to take notes and I'm going to take those notes and then put them into a structure where I, we can say, here's some information that they provided that can be into the book. And, and people will sort of see how these things come together. I think that might be interesting to people. I don't know. Um, That's great. Yeah. So we'll, so we'll see. I'm excited for it. Yeah, I'm kind of excited and nervous about it. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's a new it's a new way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, and Windows uh, Windows Eight Secrets. When is the when is the date for that? I don't know, but it it's it has to be within the next month. I mean, it's published, so. Um, I don't know. I haven't heard yet. I mean, I think the next thing I'll hear from the publishing company will be what that date is. You Are you know? not having a launch party? No, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I, I, in fact, I got to write them and ask. I'm going to New Zealand, as you know, for an event that's next week. I don't think the book's going to be available for that event. It's too early, I believe. I'm gonna, I'll find out. Um, Wiley is very good about sending copies of the books out, uh, the book out. So if there is a Windows, 7, uh, Windows 8 launch event, I, there were rumors that there's going to be one in New York on that date, the 26th or whatever. Um, maybe I bring some books there and we do that. Or maybe we go, you know, we, we're doing a Build Blogger Bash out at uh, Build the next week. I can bring the books there. Oh, very cool. Uh, give away that kind of way. So uh, well, I'll definitely have books to give away at some events at some time. But Yeah, I, maybe I, we can do a giveaway on the show too. Oh, definitely. Yeah, of course. So I know a lot of people have been asking me if uh, we're going to be doing a giveaway of the book. and uh, Sure. I don't I've, really I've been saying funny. yes I, yeah. for you. Yeah, it's fine. I don't really think about it. I, I'm kind of moving on to the next thing, but I, yeah, of course. Very cool, Paul. Uh, it is time to wrap it up. We went, we did, we went over. We went 30 minutes over. We went an hour and a half today. <laughs> yeah, when Paul and I start talking about patents, it gets a little crazy I here. I going on Longhorn and I can't, <laughs> I can't stop. Longhorn and patents. We could do about five hours on that. Uh, to check out more, um, anything with uh, Windows and Microsoft and uh, pretty much everything else. You don't just write about Windows and Microsoft anymore. You, you cover everything. You go to winsupersite.com uh, for all things Paul. So Paul does a great podcast every Thursday on the Twit Network, Windows Weekly at 2 p.m. East. Uh, I say it every week, and I'll continue to say it. One of my favorite podcasts on the uh, on the Internet. Also, uh, you can follow Paul at The Rot. I'm Andrew Zarian on Twitter. Uh, you could also uh, check out the show. If you miss any portion of the show, you can check it out on our website at gfkeynetwork.com. We archive it within 24 hours. Last week, guys, I apologize. We had a little delay with the show when people were going crazy. How dare you? Uh, did you see? We were getting. I mean, <laughs> I I got about thirty messages. Where is the show? We yeah. had to put in an we had to put in an ad for our advertiser for Audible. We had to edit something, and it took us a little longer than we had expected. But this week we should have it up. I think probably by tonight the show should be up. So uh, everything is back to normal. Also, we encourage feedback. You can send your emails to guysfromqueens at gmail dot com. And uh, I try to get back to all of you. Uh, sometimes I miss it, but um, send an email and I'll try to get back. And if it's for Paul, I'll send it to Paul. Until next time, guys, uh, good night and uh, see you all later.